Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be taking a look at generative modeling in Blender 2.8 through the use of the modifiers tag. The idea behind this is that you can generate cool and detailed looking objects in a short amount of time with relatively little effort. As well as this, the objects we create with this method are highly customizable as we can continually adjust values to create a wide range of new variations and results. The way we do this is by taking an input mesh and manipulating the mesh data with a sequence of modifiers that are used to perform a list of operations such as displacements, edge splitting, decimating, bisecting and more. The more modifiers we use, the more control over variation we will have, at the cost of performance due to an increase in calculation time. Before we start, I want to give a brief mention to Emiliano Colantoni, who has inspired me to dive into this subject. They have been doing wonderful procedural and generative artwork with Blender, and I highly recommend checking out their Twitter page. I'll leave appropriate links down in the description. In the end, we can end up with results like this. These are demonstration artworks I've created using the method we're going to be talking about later in the video. You can download all of these files for free from the link in the description so you can see how everything was set up and use them to create your own cool artworks. Just to show you a before and after of this process, here I have an object from one of the artwork files. On the left, I have an input mesh before the modifiers are activated, and on the right, I have a resulting mesh. By manipulating values in the modifier stack, we can drastically change the shape and flow with minimal effort. You can create all sorts of generative effects this way, but in this video, I'll show you how I achieve this faceted hard surface style. Before I show you how to do this, we're going to talk a bit more about the theory behind proceduralism and generation. If you want to skip ahead to the main tutorial, then go to the timestamp on the screen now. So when it comes to terms like generative and procedural, I think there's a lot of overlap in the definitions, which is why I've been using them interchangeably. Digital industries are moving towards procedural workflows because they save a lot of time and consequently money. You may have seen Andrew Price's talk at the Blender conference in 2018 about AI and the rising potential and application of procedural workflows. It mentions the use of Houdini, which, as part of its selling points, puts a great emphasis on procedural workflows, allowing the user to design and build complex content generators. Despite often seeing the terms used in conjunction, procedural workflows don't necessarily need to be enhanced by artificial intelligence, just like they don't need to be enhanced by seeded randomization techniques, such as in the case for infinite video game worlds. Procedural generation is simply the use of procedures to generate content, which, at its lowest level, is what everyone is already doing anyway. For example, extruding a simple face calls on a procedure which automatically generates new vertices and the edges between them, at distances that are specified by the position of the cursor. It saves a significant amount of time and does most of the effort for you, so why don't we call this creation of data procedural generation? I would say that there's a grey area in the definition, where a certain threshold of complexity and variety of the end results is expected before a workflow becomes impressive enough for us to label it as procedural generation. Using node graphs to create procedural systems is popular among software because it allows for a simple and easy way to both create and visualize layers of detail and control. But how is this relevant to modeling? Well, I've been using the terms generative and procedural somewhat interchangeably, partly because I've been diving into a community of artists who focus primarily on producing generative artwork. The point I want to get across is that there's no concrete wall separating the definitions of the terms. According to the Wikipedia page, generative art refers to art that in whole or in part has been created with the use of an autonomous system. In the case of what I will show you today, Blender's modifier stack will act as our autonomous system. By adding modifiers, we are defining the rules of the system so that when they are activated on the object, it will automatically give us a stylized result. In other such cases, like building procedural materials in Blender, the node graph becomes the autonomous system, where the nodes are used to specify the rule set. On the screen, we can see the work of Simon Thomas, who has been whipping up material magic in Blender and sharing their work for free. He also has a YouTube channel if you want to go over there and say hi. So now that we've talked a bit about theory, let's take a look at how to build a system like this. To start with, we're going to jump into an empty blend file and create a new cube. Bit by bit, we're going to add various layers of modifiers to create the effect. We'll start with a subdivision surface modifier and increase the subdivisions to something like 4. This will give our input shape more geometry and help provide more variety in the next step when displacing the surface. Following that, we'll add a displace modifier. For this, we'll click on New to create a new texture and click the Show Texture in Texture tab button on the right to bring up the texture settings. What we're going to do here is click on the Type drop-down and choose one of the generated textures. You can pick whatever you like, as you can use any of them to build up different styles, but I'm going to go with the Musgrave pattern. You can also change specific settings for the texture generation here, but I'm going to leave them at the defaults for now. If we go back to the Modifier tab, I'm going to set the strength of the Displace modifier to negative 0.1, so we can get some areas of extrusion over the surface. Then what I'm going to do is add a Decimate modifier and set it to a value of around 0.2. 
Following this, we're going to add another decimate modifier, but this time we'll change the mode to planar and set the angle limit to something like 30 degrees. If I left click and hold on the angle limit box, then drag my mouse from side to side, you can see how we are starting to construct this faceting effect. The values of the decimate modifiers will give us great control over the end result, as they provide us with the definition of the shape of the object. What you might notice at this point is that we've got some odd shading where the procedure so far is generating faces that are not completely flat. What we're going to do is add a triangulate modifier to split up all of these faces, consequently making them all flat in the process. After that, what we're going to do is add an edge split modifier and make the split angle 15 degrees. The purpose of this modifier is to define where we are going to have grooves in the mesh. The effect of this will be apparent when we add the next modifier to the stack. Now we'll add the solidify modifier. If we change the thickness value to something like negative 0.02, then the grooves where the edge split modifier separate the edges becomes obvious. Again, if we go back to the first decimate modifier and scrub the value, then you can quickly see how easy it is to start generating all kinds of variations with simple value changes. This is a good example of how changes early on can have significant effects on the end result, aka the butterfly effect of data. After the solidify modifier, we can add a bevel modifier and make sure that the clamp overlap is enabled. If we set the limit method to angle, then we can prevent the modifier from trying to bevel every single edge and instead restrict it to the edges of the major segments. You can play around with the values to get other interesting effects. I'm going to set the angle to 30 degrees and increase the segment count to 3. Following from that, if we want to symmetrize details, we can add a mirror modifier and enable X bisect, or the bisect for any other axis, to make the object the same on both sides. So what we've built here is a simple system for taking an input mesh and generating a more interesting result using only modifiers. By changing simple values, this modifier stack also gives us control to generate a variety of results. You don't have to reconstruct the entire modifier stack for every object you want to apply the style to as well. If you've got a new object you want to create some generative variations from, you can select it, then select the original object with the appropriate modifiers, then press Ctrl plus L and choose Modifiers. This will copy the modifiers with the correct values over to the new object for you. Now that we've taken a look at how to build an example generative style with modifiers, we're going to take a look at how you could use this to create artwork. Remember that since we are using decimation for major control over variety with our modifier stack, whatever input mesh we provide it with should have sufficient density of geometry to give the operations enough data to work with. What I'm going to do is take one of my base character rigs and put it into a simple pose. After I'm happy with that, I'll copy over the modifiers from our style example using Ctrl plus L. As you can see, it works right away, and as I play with the values, we can change the look of the faceting effect. For the artwork files included in the resources, what I did was separate the head from the body and give them different parameters to get more interesting results. The heads are created using a simple sculpted object that acts as a general silhouette of the shape that I would like the final result to look like. You can imagine how useful this is because it means that you don't have to be particularly good at sculpting or modeling to generate cool looking objects. So if you think this looks fun and it might be something you want to play around with, feel free to download these files for free from the link in the description and see what kind of cool effects you can come up with. Remember to tag me in anything you make so I can take a look at your work. I am very interested in doing more complex generative artwork in the future and I'm not announcing anything at the moment, but I've started working on some scripting experiments that might make their way into future videos. Most of my experience with proceduralism comes from environment generation in Unity, and most of my Python experience comes from Maya plugin development when I was writing scripts to translate digital robotics animations into readable data files for Robomoco. So if I'm going to make things for Blender, then I'm going to take some time to familiarize myself with its internal structure. So I think that will do for this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. You can also follow me on social media and join our Discord server to take part in discussions, get sneak previews on upcoming content, and share your work. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.